Welcome back to Paleo Talks. We are on episode 40. That is hard to believe, everybody. Episode 40. And so excited today to have Advait with us. How are you doing, Advait? Good, good. Thanks for having me. You bet. And we're going to learn about uh, some of the, uh, the India history. We have not had any aspect of this paleontology yet, so really excited about that. Also, I think our general knowledge of some of the Pleistocene extinctions from that time are relatively lacking, uh, at least my knowledge of that is. So he's going to catch us up on that, and that's really, really going to be uh, fun and exciting. Before we get more into the introductions, let's go over to David, where he can tell us a little bit more about the show, how the show works. Absolutely. Thanks, Blaine. Welcome, everybody, to another Paleo Talks. It looks like a lot of our audience is returning, folks. For anybody who's new, the format, uh, as it always is, is that we're going to start by introducing our guest and then having our main presentation. And then when that presentation is over, some portion of the way through the uh, timing of the program, we'll open it up to audience questions. So after the presentation, the whole rest of the program is going to be Q&A with our guest. At that point, we will remind you to go ahead and start putting your questions in the comments of the Facebook chat, and I'll be reading them out for uh, the guest. If for any reason you can't leave a comment on Facebook, I'll be keeping an eye on the Gray Fossil Sites Twitter and Instagram account, so you can send us messages over there as well. All right. Thank you, David. Also with us, we have Dr. Chris Widga, as usual, and he's the one who uh, suggested we bring Advait on here. So thanks again, Chris, for that suggestion. And I know your microphone's going in and out a little bit today, so we'll have to ask you to, to loud it up if we if we need you. But moving over yes, to <laughs> moving over to Advait, if you could, um, you know, again, this is just so fascinating to us, and I love your title, and it means you're going to be talking a lot about tigers, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> so the fossil record there, yeah, just so fascinating. I think so many of us start out in our historical geology classes with this concept in our mind of India as this continent moving to the north and eventually crashing into this, this larger continent and, and raising the Himalayas, but not necessarily knowing or learning a lot more about what's happening with all of those organisms that were being carried on that island continent for so long. And uh, again, the fossil record of what's going on there, I just don't know. And I'm so intrigued to hear about uh, that story. Yeah, and, and, and you aren't the only one. It's, 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 it's an understudied part of the world. Most of the fossils are forgotten. And I'm trying to bring them uh, back to the forefront of paleontology. Yeah, and in our pre-chat when we were talking, I asked if there were any caves and uh, the answer was- Caves, yeah. Yeah, not many caves at all, not many known. So excited to hear about what kinds of fossil sites you have. And what we like to do when we start is just have you tell us sort of a self-introduction of your background and how you got into paleontology in the first place. And then that road that took you to where you're at now at Yale. Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in Bombay um, in India. And I got into the, the natural world from a young age. My, my folks bought me the World Book Encyclopedia and a whole bunch of these, these other books on animals and dinosaurs. And I was obsessed with, with them um, since I could talk. I think one of the first words that I could say was humu, humu kuapua, which is a state fish of Hawaii because my dad would, would read uh, F in, in the World Book to me and, 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 and I loved learning about fish. But over time, my, my interest broadened to things like elephants and dinosaurs. Uh, but I didn't get into paleontology until I got to grad school. So I came to college uh, in the US in 2007. I went to Reed in, in Portland, Oregon, and I studied ecology. And I worked on frogs because I wanted to learn about whole organisms. And then I moved on to a master's program at George Mason, where I, extend, I expanded my focus to learn about the ecology of coral reef fish because I wanted to learn about longer term uh, patterns. But then I, I realized that if I want to truly understand long term patterns in time and about how different ecological processes like, like climate affect ecosystems, I, I have to go back in time. And which is how I got interested in studying the fossil record uh, professionally. 
So I did my PhD with Mark Ewan at George Mason. Um, and I was at the Smithsonian at that time as well. And through a chance encounter with Kay uh, Bernsmeyer one day in, in Paleo, she told me to go in and look at the Sibalic uh, fossils from North India because we actually have a pretty good record of, of mammals from there. And I was just blown away by, by, by the number of different fossils that we have from the subcontinent. That's how I slowly got, got interested in looking at India. And then I also realized that not a lot of work had been done in this place. And it was kind of low hanging fruit. Part of it is because I'm from there and I feel this affinity to, to fossils from my, from my homeland. And part of it is that I just want to tell people about this incredible story of, 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 of India's fossils. Yeah, wonderful. And you went out and got your PhD? Got my PhD, got a postdoc at the Smithsonian after that, where I worked with Matt Corano. And we worked on slightly different things. We, we, we worked on the ecology of mammalian and dinosaurian herbivores. The idea being to figure out if uh, large sizes are more common in the record than they are today and, and, and whether ecological processes stay relatively unchanged through time, whether you're in the Mesozoic or in the Cenozoic. But at the same time, I also worked on the megafaunal extinction in, in, in South Asia, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And that kind of led me to a second postdoc at Yale, which is where I am now. And I'm trying to understand the anthropogenic context of this extinction. No one's really looked at whether people had gone and, and, and killed any of these animals. We, we have very, very few sites with cut mark bones, if any. And so one of my goals pre-pandemic was to travel and go and do some more uh, field work and, and find more sites, date them, and look for these uh, for, 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 for uh, cut marks. But all of that kind of got derailed in 2020. Wow, what a diverse background. Are you going to circle back around and make sure you do some fossil frogs and fossil fish? Uh, I would love to do fossil frogs and fish. I just don't know <laughs> enough about them. <laughs> yeah, not many of us do, except, especially in the Cenozoic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wonderful. If you could go ahead and share your screen with us and we'll move right into the presentation to remind everybody we're being brought to you by the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, uh, which oversees the five million year old gray fossil site. So come and see us sometime. And anytime you're ready, uh, it looks like your presentation is up there and we can see it. it looks great. All right. Thanks, Blaine. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the megafaunal extinctions in, in a largely understudied part of the world, the Indian subcontinent, a part of the world that is very special to me. Um, when we think about India, and if you've read about, uh, about the wildlife of India, the first thing that comes to mind is the tiger. India is commonly called the land of the tiger because tigers are, are some of the most common charismatic uh, megafauna that you find on the subcontinent today. But we also have animals like the Asian elephant there, the Indian rhino, but not that long ago, we had a, a, a whole host of other very large, very charismatic species, including things like hippos, which go extinct not a long time ago. And the, 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 the fossil record of, 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 of India is actually uh, quite diverse, uh, quite long ranging. We have mammals all the way from the Jurassic all the way up to the modern. Uh, including uh, some, some key uh, fossils that uh, tell us quite a bit about the evolution of, of mammals. For example, we have cambithers from, from, from the Eocene, which are some of the earliest odd-toed ungulates or persodactyls. Uh, whales evolve uh, in the Indian subcontinent when India was still an island colliding with Asia. Some of the largest land mammals to have ever lived, paraceratherus, have been found in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent and they tell us about how body size evolves in mammals. The Himalayan Foreland Basin uh, has one of the richest fossil deposits for mammals anywhere in the world. We have almost continuous deposition of fossil mammals from about 18 million years to half a million years ago. And we pretty much have, have every single order of mammals found in the old world in these deposits. And this includes uh, animals like Brahmatherium, which is a giraffe with a pointy head, um, giant proboscideans like the Stegodon ganesa with uh, 12 to 14 foot long tusks, uh, horses like, like these three-toed hipparians, and these longhorned uh, cattle called Bosa from the earliest part of the Pleistocene. 
But the focus of my talk today is going to be on mammals from the last 50,000 years or mammals from the late Quaternary. So the Quaternary uh, period includes two epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. And this period is characterized by these fluctuating glacial and interglacial patterns. Uh, the last 50,000 years represents the last bit of the Pleistocene and most of the Holocene, which is an interglacial or warm period where we live. And I'm interested in this period of time because it's in the last 50,000 years that we start to lose most of the large mammals around the world. Some of the first extinctions take place in Australia where large mammals like Diprotodon, which is the giant uh, wombat-like animal and Anthalacoleo go extinct. Uh, between about 20,000 years and 12,000 years, we lose a lot of large species in the Americas and parts of Northern Eurasia. By the middle of the Holocene, by about 5,000 years, we lose the rest of the large mammals uh, that, are, that are in, in parts of, of Eastern Europe uh, and Russia and, and some large mammals in Africa as well. And by about 500 years ago, we start to lose large animals on oceanic islands like ground slots in the Caribbean, giant lemurs and giant birds in Madagascar and New Zealand. And what this leaves us with is a distribution of large mammals, which are mostly concentrated in Africa and South Asia. And so these extinctions over the last 50,000 years are, are what are known as the megafaunal extinctions. And they're kind of strange because the extinctions seem to target large mammals more than smaller species. Um, the median size of, 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 of mammals that, that goes extinct in this time is about, uh, about 182 kilograms, which roughly translates to about 300 pounds. Um, the other curious thing is that these extinctions uh, were ver uh, varied in magnitude across the world. Some places got hit a lot harder than others. For example, the Americas uh, lost about 80% of their large mammals weighing more than 50 kilograms. Australia loses almost all of its mammals weighing more than 50 kilograms. Madagascar lost everything that was big. Uh, compared to that, Eurasia and Africa lose fewer species. The other pattern uh, that you may be able to see here is that the extinctions don't take, take place at the same time. They're kind of staggered across the world and they seem to correlate with the dispersal of Homo sapiens outside Africa. But what about the Indian subcontinent, which is the other place where we still have a lot of large mammals today? What's going on there in, in the context of these extinctions? And for the longest time, we had no I, I idea what these extinctions were like in this part of the world and, and whether they significantly impacted the, the fauna or not. But, but a lot of that was because no one had synthesized all of this data from the, from the subcontinent. Fossil mammals have been known from India since the 1800s. They were first discovered by the British who were there um, as the East India Company before 1857. And they had governed lots of parts of the subcontinent here represented in pink. And between 1832 and 1844, a colonial doctor named G.G. Spilsbury started to explore parts of central India in this, in this British territory called the Narmada territory, named after the Narmada uh, River, which flows through there. Um, and he was answering an ad in the Journal of the Asiatic Society of, of, of Bengal to send fossils back to Calcutta. So he goes along the course of the river from these towns starting from Jabalpur to Narsingpur and Hoshangabad and starts collecting fossils. And he starts finding so many of them that he even starts listing them on the maps that he, that he draws of his, of his excursions. Uh, so if you take a look at the close up here, you can see that, that there are three spots where he lists fossil bones or fossil horses or fossil ele elephants, which are found along this tributary. And this seems to be a common practice back in the day. When the French uh, found Big Bone Lick in Kentucky in, in the 1700s, uh, on subsequent maps, they started to list, the, list Big Bone Lick as the place where elephant bones are found. These elephants were in fact mastodons, but I digress. It seems to be a, a common practice for these early explorers. Some of these fossils were, were used by local Indians for their daily trades. Uh, this is a palette of an extinct uh, a proboscidean called Paleoloxodon 
pneumaticus and it was used by a local Indian washerman to wash his clothes. So he, he would take his clothes and beat them against this fairly flat tooth and, and, and uh, palate hoping to clean them. Well, that's really funny because we often refer to their teeth as sort of looking like a washboard. Yep, and they were used as a literal washboard. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I gotta use this story. <laughs> <laughs> So all of these fossils then ended up uh, at the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Calcutta, where James Princip, who was a notable Orientalist in India, was, was interested in learning about the, the, the prehistory of the subcontinent. He was inspired by the, 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 the fossils that Hugh Falconer found up north in the, in the Savaliks and wanted to, to get a sense of, of what the record was like in the rest of the country. From there, these fossils ended up at the NHM in London and at the Indian Museum in Calcutta, where they were cataloged and described by Falconer and Lidecker. And he named about 16 extinct species from central India by this time. This, and this, this list in, includes animals like bears, it, it includes rhinos and horses, uh, some species of elephants, hippos, buffalo, uh, cows, and deer. After that, there was about a hiatus of 50 years between excavations. Uh, there are a couple of, of political things going on in the subcontinent at that time in 1857. Uh, there was a, a revolt from Indian soldiers against the East India Company and eventually the, the British crown took over. So in that uh, political uh, unrest, there, there wasn't a lot of excavation going on. Excavations were started again in 1883 by Robert Foote who was sent by the Geological Survey of, of India to find evidence of early man in the subcontinent. So he goes down to, to South India, where there, where there have been reports of, of tools coming out of Kurnul caves in Andhra Pradesh. And he goes to these caves and finds this incredible cache of fossil bones from a number of different stratigraphic levels. And this was the first time that we saw uh, primates and car and carnivores and small mammals from 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 parts of central and southern India, which which added to our our understanding of the overall fauna, and amongst all of these species that he uncovered were about nine species that that he thought went extinct in the subcontinent. After that, there was a there was a lull in collecting. Uh, Collecting was fairly sporadic after independence was taken up by Indian archaeologists and paleontologists, largely in, in search of stone tools. And then they, they encountered uh, fossils in these fluvial deposits where these stone tools were found. For, for instance, they, they found a species of, of hippo. They found a new species of stegodon in, in central India. Uh, there was a new kind of cave bear that was found in these Kurnul caves and a, and a species of buffalo that was, that was named from South India as well. More recently, Liz Burba from Yale, Faisal Phoebe, described a species of water buck and the genus Sivacobas actually goes all the way back into the latest part of the Pliocene in the Indian subcontinent. And this was described from a, from a place in Western India. So what this gives us is a list of about 28 species which are no longer found in the Indian subcontinent. If we want to, to understand what went on in the last 50,000 years, we need to know if any of these species were actually around in the last 50,000 years, and if any of these species are still valid. Um, so to do this, I collected as much information as I could about, about the, the ages of the deposits or of the fauna, and I did a lot of, 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 of research on the taxonomy. And it turns out that a lot of these species have poor age control. We actually don't know where they came from in peninsular India. Most of these peninsular deposits range from the middle Pleistocene all the way up to the Holocene. It's quite possible that, that some of these species come from the older part of the record, not from the last 50,000 years. Some of these species have been synonymized since they've been described. For example, the primate Cyanocephalus is now uh, thought to be Theropithecus. Equus paleonis uh, is, is now thought to be just a juvenile of Equus pneumaticus. And for a lot of species, they were named after fragmentary bits or crushed skulls. And I just didn't think that the material was sufficient enough for taxonomic purposes. So what this left me with was a list of five mammal species that, that uh, probably go extinct in the last 50,000 years. And these five mammal species include Bose pneumaticus, which is the Indian auroch, um, a hippo, 
Hexaproteron, uh, a species of, of horse, Equus nematicus, and two species of proboscidean, Paleoloxodon nematicus and Stegodon nematicus. Now, Paleoloxodon nematicus was one of the largest elephants to have ever lived. Modern day African elephants weigh, at least the bulls weigh about seven to eight tons at the most. I've estimated the weight of Paleoloxodon nematicus to be about 14 tons, so slightly bigger than the big Colombian mammoths that we find in, in North America. Uh, and this is one of the, the, the best preserved skulls, which is kept in the, in the museum in, in Calcutta. Stegodon nematicus uh, is another species of large proboscidean. Stegodons don't get a lot of press and they deserve more attention in my opinion. They're fairly charismatic animals with these enormous tusks and roof-shaped teeth. Morphologically, they, they start to approach elephantids and even dentally, they start to add more plates just like you see in a lot of elephants today. What did you say their teeth are shaped like? Like, so they've got cusps which look like this. So they kind of like, so think of a mastodon tooth with those pointy cusps, but uh, an individual stegodon tooth will have 12 of those instead of just three or four, which is what you see in typical, in, in, in mastodons. So again, huge animals with enormous tusks, almost approaching the, the, the size of the, of the gray ma mastodon tusks in, in some in instances. Uh, the fossil record of stegodons is fairly scanty. They were largely known from isolated teeth, but a colleague of mine, Bart Johan, recently discovered a partial skeleton of one of these stegodons in central India. Equus nematicus is something that I like to call the Indian zebra. I like to call this because modern day equids can be divided into two groups. You've got cabaline horses and stenonian horses. Cabaline horses are characterized by a U-shaped loop in their enamel on their lower teeth, whereas stenonian horses have a V-shaped loop. And it turns out Equus nematicus has this characteristic V-shaped loop, which you also find in modern day zebra, which is why I like calling this animal the Indian zebra. These horses probably originated in North America uh, from an ancestor like Equus simplicitus or the Hagerman horse, which is found in in Idaho. Hexaprotodon, my favorite animal from the late Pleistocene of, of India, is a six-toothed hippo. It's a fairly long-lived lineage of hippos, which first shows up in the record by, by, the, by the early part of the Pliocene. And they're fairly widespread. Hexaprotodon has been found in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and they start to disappear in Southeast Asia by the middle Pleistocene. And the last uh, species uh, is found in the Indian subcontinent. There are two species that have been described, Hexaprotodon nematicus and Hexaprotodon paleoindicus, and they can largely be distinguished by the size and position of the second incisor in relation to the first and the third on the lower jaw. Unless you find the mandibular symphysis, it's really hard to tell what species you have. Nematicus has large eye twos, uh, whereas Paleoindicus has very, very small and elevated eye twos. This uh, number of teeth and the way that image looked that you just showed prior, just terrifying looking. Yeah. <laughs> Hippos have a lot of sharp pointy teeth. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure they're actually using any of their front teeth uh, to process food. They, they, they might be using them to kind of pluck grass. Most of the, of the grinding work is done by the molars. They, they Is this a know. genus that was known outside of India? Yep, it's, it's been found in Africa as well. So it evolves in Africa, disperses out along with a lot of, of other species and, and is then found in the subcontinent in the Pliocene. So I like to, to classify any hippos that are found in the late Pleistocene as Hexaprotodon spa because you can't actually tell what species it is un, 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 unless you find an intact mandible. And so far, I haven't seen a lot of convincing evidence for either of these species. The last mammal uh, is Bos nematicus. Uh, so you've probably heard of aurochs in Europe, right? Bos primigenius, uh, which is a species of wild ca cattle, which was domesticated into the domesticated cattle that, 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 that we see. India also had a species of wild cattle, Bos nematicus. It's oftentimes called Bos primigenius nematicus. So Nematicus is thought of as a subspecies of the, of the European auroch. Uh, and we think this is the direct ancestor of the modern domestic zebu cattle. 
and, ge and genetic studies tends to support an Asian origin for the zebu uh, cattle. So this isn't a true extinction. This is what I like, like to call a pseudo extinction because the, the lineage actually still persists today in the domesticated form, which looks something like this. So slightly smaller in stature, the horns don't curve out as much, but uh, you, you still have large cows in India. What was also interesting is that, is that you find ostriches in these late Pleistocene sites, and they're oftentimes found as ostrich eggshell beads or ostrich egg, or fragments of the shells that have been etched uh, as pieces of art. And uh, people have done some ancient DNA work uh, on these eggshells and have found that it's probably the same species that you find in East Africa today. So there was a range expansion at some point in the Pleistocene and then a range contraction. So this represents a local ex ex extinction in India. So I then wanted to figure out exactly when these species go extinct in the last 50,000 years to see if we can correlate that with, with any changes in climate or with human activity. To do this, I collected as much information as I could from dated sites in, the, in peninsular India from the last 50,000 years. I could find 52 sites with associated dates. These dates are not as great as some of the good rate of carbon dates that we might get from uh, samples in Siberia or the Yukon where collagen preservation is, is really good. Most of these, these dates come from um, eggshell fragments or from charcoal or from uh, mollusk shells. Of these 52 sites, 24 sites had the extinct species that I just talked about. And using that, I could generate a, a preliminary extinction chronology for these six taxa. One thing to note about the fossil record is that it's notoriously incomplete. And you can't actually say a species goes extinct until the last known individual goes extinct, but we're never gonna find the last known individual of a species. So what we oftentimes do is we estimate when a species goes extinct based on the distribution of the available dates for that species. And I used a technique that's commonly used in quaternary paleoecological studies called GRIWM. Um, and that looks at the actual gaps between individual dates and it upweights more recent dates than older dates. You need five dates to estimate an, an extinction time. So I couldn't do this for Stegodon because it's only known from three dated sites. So, but the, but the last appearance date for Stegodon pneumaticus is about 30,000 years. The estimated extinction times for, for the zebra and paleo Loxodon fall in the latest part of the Pleistocene, and the ostrich and the hippo seem to persist into the earliest part of the Holocene. I didn't calculate a projected extinction time for the auroch because we know it survives today in the domesticated form, but the wild types stop showing up in the record at about 5,000 years, and domestication starts at about 10,000 years ago. So there, there's, there's a 5,000 year overlap between domestic morphs and, and wild types. And this gives us an extinction window of about 22,000 years. Then I wanted to compare this extinction window to what's going on environmentally and with people in the Indian subcontinent because people and climate have been, in, have been implicated in the megafaunal extinctions elsewhere. So let's just focus in on this extinction window which goes from about 8,000 years to 30,000 years. And I compared that to the Greenland ice core oxygen isotope record, which is a record of uh, temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere. And I also compared it to a monsoonal record from cave sites in Northeast in, in India from, from cave speleothems. So what you're seeing here is colder on the right and warmer to the left and weaker monsoons to the right and stronger monsoons to the left. Basically, if it's warm, you tend to have stronger monsoons. If it's colder, then you tend to have weaker monsoons. And in this extinction interval, we have three periods, the last glacial maximum, Heinrich event one, and the younger Dryas, which are particularly cold and dry. And Heinrich event one, uh, is characterized by these mega droughts in South and Southeast Asia. Like the, the monsoon failed in a lot of places. And we see this evidence in, in, in fluvial systems where the rivers just dry up. Uh, 
but it seems like the fauna has survived through multiple fluctuations of, of temperature and the monsoon. So climate probably had something to do with it, but it probably wasn't sufficient to kill all of them off. What about people? Well, people have been in the Indian subcontinent for a long time. And when I say people here, I'm talking about our species, Homo sapiens. The archaeological record of, of Homo sapiens goes back to about, uh, about 48,000 years. Genetic evidence suggests that it goes back older. But scientists um, at the Max Planck in Germany have suggested that older sites uh, in the Indian subcontinent with stone tools might also represent uh, tools that were made by Homo sapiens. So this record is potentially uh, going all the way back to about 100,000 years, which seems to correlate with, with early Homo sapien records in parts of the Arabian Peninsula and in China. The extinction window correlates uh, not so much with the arrival of people. There's a, there's a fairly large time lag of about 30,000 years, but it seems to correlate with a shift in tool technologies. You get a shift from uh, these larger tools to, to a tool technology called microliths. And these are small projectile points that we find after about 45,000 years. And alongside these changes in, in, in tool technologies, we also see an increase in human populations in South Asia. So this is the effective population size. And between about 40,000 years and 20,000 years, South and Southeast Asia had about, about a third of the world's population. So what we can conclude from these fairly rough correlations is that we had a low magnitude but highly sized biased extinction. All of the species that go extinct are large and on average are larger than the species that survived. The extinction takes place several thousand years after the arrival of Homo sapiens on the subcontinent. It coincides with fluctuating rainfall patterns and increases in human population size and more sophisticated tool technologies. So this, this extinction is fairly different from what we're seeing in other parts of the world, like the Americas, where the extinction seems seem to take place fairly rapidly after the arrival of humans. In India, there's a fairly large time lag between the arrival of our species and the extinctions. A similar pattern is seen in, in parts of Northern Eurasia, where there is a longer time lag between the extinctions. The extinctions tend to be more smeared uh, from 50,000 years to about 5,000 years ago. What's notable here though, is the magnitude of the extinction. India only loses 15% of mammals weighing more than 50 kilograms. That's very similar to the extinction magnitude seen in parts of Africa. And these are substantially lower than the extinction magnitude seen in the Americas, in parts of Northern Europe and in Australia and, and of course the Oceanic Islands. So what's going on here? Why does India still have so many large species? Well, one explanation could be co-evolution. And this is an, an explanation that's been put forth for Africa. Why do we still have large animals like elephants and rhino and hippo in Africa? Um, the argument is that because hominins and, and our species evolved in Africa alongside the lineages of all of these living megafauna there, the megafauna may have evolved strategies to avoid people or deal with whatever we're doing on the landscape. And it seems like that may have gone on in the Indian subcontinent as well. We don't have a very good fossil record for hominins. Um, this is probably the oldest hominin fossil from the subcontinent. It's a calvarium of a species of Homo from the Narmada Valley. Uh, it's probably middle Pleistocene in age, but we still don't have any good dates on the specimen. But we do have a pretty good stone tool record and multiple types of tool technologies, which may be associated with multiple types of humans going back almost 2 million years. We know that Homo erectus leaves Africa sometime around 2 million years. And after that, Homo erectus or, 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 or similar hominins are found all the way from parts of, of, of Spain to Southeast Asia. Another possibility is that hominins in South Asia may have favored smaller prey compared to larger species. There's one cave site in Sri Lanka where the, where the majority of, of uh, fauna found alongside tools is from small species. You get an, an overwhelming abundance of animals like monkeys and squirrels and civets, but very few large taxa, even though Sri Lanka does have a lot of large species. 
But again, this is a sample size of one, hard to extrapolate that out to the rest of the subcontinent, especially when we do have sites from the Holocene where, where we have examples of butchered cervids and bovids. Another possible explanation is strong metapopulation networks. Lots of these species which survive in the Indian subcontinent once ranged all the way from West Asia to East Asia and Southeast Asia. And we know from deep time paleontological studies of mass extinctions that if you have a large geographic range size, your resilience to extinction increases. It's possible that a lot of the, the survivors were just fairly widespread and then had enough of a metapopulation network to, to, to come and rescue some of these populations which would have gone locally extinct in the subcontinent. The species which go extinct are all endemics to India. They're only found there. They're probably found in smaller fragmented populations which are more likely to go extinct. And lastly, India actually has quite a bit of habitat heterogeneity, even in more harsh uh, periods like the last glacial maximum. While uh, tropical savannas and deserts would have spread in these colder and drier uh, periods, you, you still have large parts of the subcontinent covered by tropical woodlands and grassland mosaics acting as refugia for these animals. We know that Asian elephants would have occupied some of these refugia in, in, in Sri Lanka and in Southeast Asia and then recolonized parts of mainland India in, in more uh, favorable times. But in all probability, it was a combination of all of these factors that led to the survival of these species on the subcontinent. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that, that, the, that, that these uh, uh, megafauna didn't share the, the same uh, fate as, 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 as the zebra or the other el elephants. Although it's, it's quite sad that we lost the hippo because it would have been cool to have, have hippos uh, somewhere outside of Africa. Uh, but I want to leave you all with a quote from Alfred Russell Wallace. And he famously said in 1876 that we live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest, fiercest, and strangest forms have recently disappeared. And he's talking about these extinctions which took place not that long ago when we lost most of the charismatic megafauna from around the world. And all of these factors that have been implicated in the, in the extinctions, environmental change, humans, all of these factors are accelerating at an unprecedented level. And if we are not careful, we face uh, a future where we're going to lose the rest of these animals that now live in Asia and Africa today. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, East Tennessee State and the Great Fossil Site for, in for inviting me. Um, and I want to thank all my collaborators and the institutions which have supported me uh, through this time and which have made this work possible. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. That's really interesting. You know, and I was sitting there as you were presenting and I, the, the quote in Wallace kept coming up in my mind and then you show it right there at the end. <laughs> it's such a wonderful quote and, and really nails it um, in so many ways. One of the things I'm wondering is, you know, as you're looking at this question uh, on on this subcontinent, are you very much looking at it as sort of a first stab? Yeah, I mean, because here in North America, there's so much, there's such a wealth of papers and research that you have to weed through in this sort of compilation. But if it, if it is sort of this first stab, um, how do you see it potentially changing as more dates are coming into play? Right, uh, and that, that's a great question because the the work that I've done is the first synthetic work on this extinction in the region. I think some of the problems that we might encounter with the dates is that they might be younger than they actually are because we have this issue of, of young carbon getting into some of these older shells. Um, so if that's the case, then maybe we'll see the extinctions closer to the, to the arrival of our species, which would indicate a, a pattern more similar to what we're seeing in the Americas. Uh, at the same time, some of these older dates might actually be too old. There might be older carbon which has been taken in by some of these uh, shells or, or bone that's been uh, dated in the past. And the fauna might be seen to survive into the Holocene. Uh, 
which has been hypothesized for, for, for other parts of, of Eurasia as, as well. It's still a, a big un, a, a unknown, but th this is a, a first stab and, and a first hypothesis for what's going on. In and do you see that as sort of a future direction of your research is trying to do better dating? Yep, yep. One of the problems that we have is that India is a tropical place and collagen does not preserve at all. Uh, I think the hippo specimen that I directly dated, we got a minimal amount of collagen. Uh, so we had to date the mineral fraction in, in the appetite, um, which is problematic in and of itself because it, it's subject to diagenesis as well. And enamel dates tend to be younger. But until we figure out better ways of, of directly dating this, this specimen, that this is the best uh, in, information that, that we have to go on. Thank you. Well, Chris is going to figure out that enamel dating, so. <laughs> I, it'd be nice. But actually, you know, I'm kind of thinking along the same lines here, I think. Um, you know, if you, post-pandemic, time and energy uh, and money are not an option. You know, there's, you, you're basically resetting the clock on a lot of our continental extinction projects, right? You're, you're basically building this from the ground up and you kind of looking at, how these things have played out in Europe or how, how the research has played out in North America, you know, moving forward, would you emphasize dating? Would you emphasize additional field work? Would you emphasize, you know, what is the most important thing to tackle next? Uh, the, the most important thing to tackle is finding fossils in the right context. A lot of these fossils are currently taken out of their context and we can't even trace some of the, the, the specimens which have been dated in, in collections in, in, in the subcontinent. India has a problem of resources where uh, museums are not as well managed as North American museums are and specimens oftentimes get lost or they get uh, mislabeled. So I think fresh excavations are important to, uh, to at least try and, and place some of these species in a, a, a well who's all stratigraphic column. And then we can start to get dates from them. At least then we, we, we can see which species come before and after in, in a relative sense. But after that, yeah, dates. If we can get any kind of luminescence dates, which might help correlate with the rate of carbon dates, I think that, 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 that would be a, 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 a great help to Indian paleontology. Chris, did you want to follow up on that before David starts? Uh, David, can, yeah, David can get going, but I mean, it sounds almost like you need warm bodies. You know, you need more researchers, you need, you know, a community that, I mean, there's, there's certainly a community that's already there and working on this, but, um, you know, there's so much stuff to be done, which would be fun mm -hmm. uh, getting in on the ground floor. No, for sure. All right, David, did you have did some questions have... from the audience? We sure do. We've got a bunch of people sending in questions. So again, as a, as a reminder, if you have questions, you can leave them in the Facebook comments or go over to the Gray Fossil site, Twitter or Instagram. And I'll look there. We will start. This is a question from Grant who says, uh, the species name nematicus seems pretty popular. What does it mean? So this, this, the species name nematicus comes from the Narmada River. Uh, it was called the, the nematis in Greek. So when you, uh, I guess it's not Latinized, but I'm not sure what, what the right term is when, when you convert a name to Greek but that's what they were doing back in the day. And because a lot of the holotypes were found in this valley, they, they call them all nematicus. Gotcha. All right, here's a question from Greg. This is Greg McDonald. Is there much of a fossil record of the Indian one-horned rhino? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, we have a fossil record of the one-horned rhino going back to about 200,000 years. It's possible that some of these Sivalic rhinos, which date to somewhere between, you know, three and half a million years also belong to the same species. Some people think that they are, some people think that they're a separate taxa. More people need to work on these animals. Why do you think, this is one of the questions, why do you think so little has been done overall with paleontology from this time frame, or maybe even overall in the subcontinent? 
Yeah, so uh, part of it is is a lack of resources. You know, uh, India is a poor country, and it's it's hard for the government or for universities to dedicate resources to paleontology, which you know, for better or for worse, is a luxury brand. Uh, it, it it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time, and there isn't a lot of certainty once you do the work that you'll actually get a job. And for a lot of people in India, it, it's 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 hard to survive with those odds. And so right. I, I think even here yeah. in North America growing up, it's kind of hard to imagine getting to that point of being a paleontologist. Right. But it would be a lot more so there. It's, it's even harder there. And historically, um, while there have been uh, paleontologists, they've mostly been in geology departments and the students that they train end up going on to be, you know, state geologists or, or they go and work for the Geological Survey of India. There, there just isn't a lot of interest in paleontology. There's been more interest from, 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 from the UK and, and from North America. For example, David Pilbeam's group at Harvard has been going and excavating in the Sivalix for the last 40 years. Uh, that's because of a long-term collaboration that they had with the Geological Survey of Pakistan, where they could go in and, and excavate. Uh, there have been a few efforts um, from Western paleontologists to collaborate with Indian scholars, but it, it hasn't reached the same levels as we've seen in China. And at, at the same time, we just don't have as much investment in, 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 in prehistoric resources as we've seen in, in China, where it seems to me that it's a matter of national pride, that we have the, the same kinds of fossils that you have in the West or, or, or even uh, better, but India hasn't quite, quite, quite embraced that. And, 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 and it's hard. I, I've been involved in an, in an initiative to start a, a, a paleontology museum in Delhi, and there are a lot of roadblocks, especially when it comes to the amount of, of money that it'll take to actually establish something that is world-class. All right, our next question is from Charlie. Now, uh, we joked at the beginning that you weren't gonna talk about tigers, but this is a question about tigers, so they're gonna make you do it. Charlie asks, how have these megafaunal extinctions in India affected tiger populations over time? Well, we don't know because we don't actually have a fossil record of tigers. Based on molecular divergence times, we know that the Bengal tiger diverged from tigers in Southeast Asia by about 50,000 years. So they've, they've been there in this extinction interval. We have a couple of teeth, a couple from Sri Lanka and one from South India, which might be tiger and one humerus, which might be a tiger from this period of time. But it's kind of hard to tell lions and tigers apart from post crania. So it, it's really hard to know what's going on with the carnivore populations. At the same time, there are still plenty of large species in the subcontinent. Tigers rarely go after big game like elephants, so uh, or, or, or even uh, rhino for that matter. Um, so I, th I think tiger populations would have stayed fairly stable through this period of time. There are lots of deer and antelope there for them to eat. All right, here's a fun one from Melissa Party, who asks, if you could coordinate some new field work, where would you go first? Oh boy, I, I think I'd probably go to the Narmada uh, Valley because this is where, you, where we have deposits going from the Middle Pleistocene all the way up to the Holocene. If we can get a composite stratigraphic column which shows funnel succession over the last you know, 600,000 years, I think that, that'll be super cool especially if we want to understand if the extinction rate for large mammals is different through time. Um, one of the arguments for humans causing the extinction is that the extinction rate for large mammals only increases in the last 100,000 years when people leave Africa. Uh, but it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's been hard to compare these rates in a place like the Indian subcontinent because we just don't have a good fossil record uh, in, the, in the middle Pleistocene. Here's a question from Aaron, who asks, when do calicotheres disappear in India? And do we know if there's any overlap between calicotheres and tigers? Um, there is no overlap between calicotheres and tigers. The, the last calicotheres seemed to go extinct sometime in the early Pleistocene. 
We have a colica there called Nestorotherium sivalensi. We don't have good age controls on where it comes from, but it was part of the original collections that were made by Hugh Falcon and Proby Copley in the 1830s. And based on the general uh, place where they went and found their fossils and the subsequent paleomag work that's been done there, we think they're, they're from the early Pleistocene. For those who might not know what a Calicothere is, can you tell everybody? Yeah, so the uh, Calicothere is this strange relative of horses and rhinos and tapirs. Some of them look like gorillas with a with like a weird horse-like head because they walk on their knuckles. Some of them like Moropus, which is commonly found in the Miocene, or I guess the Oligocene to, to the Miocene of North America, uh, look more like horses with longer arms and legs with giant claws on their feet. Yeah, when I see Moropus, I think, wow, what if you had a saddle on that guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if they could run pretty fast with those claws. Here's a question from Mason who asks, are there any active excavations in India for fossils from this time period? There, there are very few. So I could probably count the number of vertebrate paleontologists in, in India on one hand, um, of which I think only one conducts research in this time period. There's more archeology span work and zoo arc work that's been conducted because uh, people want to find evidence of, of hominins in the subcontinent and of stone tools. Uh, but beyond a handful of, of researchers, no one is doing work on this. All right, Barbara asks, have there been small felids in the Indian subcontinent, such as the forest and desert cats of modern Europe and Africa? There are, so we actually have uh, a quite a few small felids and, and there's, uh, there are a few fossils of them from, from these cave sites in South India. So we Greg also asks about, I'm oh, sorry, Greg also asks about radiometric dating mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not there are labs in India that could be used. There are no labs in India that currently do radiocarbon dating. There used to be labs, mm -hmm. um, like the Tata Institute of Fundamental research had a radiocarbon dating facility and then there was an, a, a, another lab in, in uh, Gujarat which, which would date specimens. But I think all of that stopped in the 1970s and 80s, which is where most of the dates from India also stop. All right, we've got a detailed question about elephants here. So this is for Advait and also Chris might want to weigh in. Stephen asks, do you think the modern Asian elephant evolved to suit the Pleistocene paleo savanna habitat of the Indian subcontinent? Looking at its hypsodont dentition and its longer digestive tract looks like hypergrazing adaptations to me. Um, yeah, so I can actually touch on that. We see a progressive increase in hypsodonty from a proboscidean from the early Pleistocene of the subcontinent called Elephas hysudricus, which is in the lineage of Elephas maximus. Um, over time, through the Pleistocene, we see a, a fluctuation of grasslands and forested environments, both in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Large parts of Southeast Asia in glacial periods were, were, were above sea level, and there was this, this large grassland corridor. And, and I do think a lot of these elephants were feeding on grasses there. S certainly today, uh, Elephas maximus feeds on grasses in, in, the, in the Brahmaputra Valley or, or in the Ganges Plain. So yeah, uh, it, they certainly could have evolved uh, more hypsodon dentition because of these grassland environments. Interesting question. All right, we've got another one here from Jenny who asked, what might explain the lack of hominin fossils in peninsular India? Um, a lack of sampling. People just haven't looked hard enough. Um, there's a lot of India to cover uh, and hominins tend to be rare in general. So that adds to why we haven't uh, found them, but we just haven't had a lot of consistent search effort over the last several decades, like we've had in Africa, for, for instance. Yeah, so I'm imagining there's not a lot of karst there. There's not a lot of cave potential 
but in those areas where there is, it, it, there's a potential. I mean, we looked at the one site that you had that was cave and it was yeah. tremendous. Yep. Yep. So a potential yep. exploration in that region could be really oh, yeah. fruitful. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and that site has been recently re-excavated by Mike Petraglia's team from the Max Planck and they have a uh, geological record going back to about 200,000 years. So it, it's the most continuous uh, record that, that we have. And from this cave site, there, there's, there's only one species that goes extinct in the last 200,000 years. It's this uh, gelata baboon, which probably goes extinct sometime in MIS-5 or before that. Hey, Edvite, I've got a question I'd like to ask. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of uh, work left to be done in India and that it is a, a place with that's, that's very distinct from a lot of other regions of the world. What do you think is the greatest potential of future paleontology in India? What, what, what are some of the biggest, most exciting things that are waiting to be learned there? I, I think uh, there's a lot of potential with the mammal fossil record, just because we have a lot of them. And when you have a dense sampling of mammals, you can start asking interesting questions about the macro e e evolution of these groups or the macro e ecology of these groups through time. The best examples of this that we have today come from North America because the fossil record here has been studied quite extensively for the last hundred years or so. Uh, but the record in India now gives us a chance to compare these more temperate records in North America to a, to a tropical fossil record in South Asia and see if latitudinally mammals are doing something differently or not. Climate tends to be more stable in the tropics. So perhaps in these more stable environments, mammalian evolution is, is doing something different from, from more fluctuating environments in temperate regions. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I think as we're wrapping up time here. This was, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount today. <laughs> and Absolutely. we look, yeah, we look forward to, to seeing your future research and in all the different areas, not just in India, but in all these different areas and, and excited to see the potential of the India subcontinent for telling its own story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be an, an exciting few decades. Yeah. I want to go. <laughs> Let's go on some caving expeditions. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a lot of students who I'm sure are itching to get outside again. Right. Take a, take a nice class trip to India. <laughs> well, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks, Blaine. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, David. This has been a lot yeah. of fun. All right. We'll thanks see everybody next week. Joining. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. <laughs>